Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And um, on behalf of the Oxford Material Society, I'd just like to welcome you to the, what I think is the 17th funeral of the Royal Benjamin. It first started in 1970, and it's always been jointly organised by the Materials Department and the local branch of the Institute of Materials, which is the Oxford Material Society. Um, I'll pass the this is very important because we sign that we get all money from the Institute. So <laughs> the, other, the other thing I would say is there is a full face up afterwards. We did keep a few spaces fair as well, so if we hadn't registered for it and we wanted to come, I think there's obviously some spare space there. So without further ado, I'll pass over to George to introduce Hello, good evening. It's a great pleasure to welcome everybody here. Uh, I'm particularly to welcome our very distinguished guest speaker, uh, Harry Medisha, who I'm proud to count as a, a friend and long-standing colleague in this field, uh, has a very interesting uh, life history. Um, I think it's, a, it's all right, this is a politically correct bit. I mean, the, 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 uh, you read the media and uh, you think the Oxford and Cambridge come over as the centre sort of, of overprivilege and elitism, etc. Uh, but Harry, I think, what the people give some light to this, his family arrived as immigrants uh, from Kenya uh, originally, and he first worked as an apprentice uh, with British Oxygen, uh, who then sponsored him uh, to take a degree course at City University. Uh, he did so well that he was able to move on to Cambridge as a PhD student, uh, and he's never looked back. A sheer merit and ability has uh, taken him to the very top of his profession. To Fellowships of the Royal Society and Royal Academy of uh, Engineering, and also the American uh, National Academy of Engineering. So uh, it's it's a great pleasure to uh, hand over to my distinguished friend and colleague, Harry Venetia, to talk to us tonight. Thank you very much, George. Uh, let me first of all say that I feel extremely nervous because I see in the audience so many people who I admire a lot. Yes. Oxford Department is actually one of my favorite places. I've benefited a lot from the work done over here. On the other hand, I don't feel nervous because I know you're all very kind and friendly. <laughs> <laughs> now, someone, just while we were having drinks, said that the title is not very good, and she almost didn't attend. Okay? There she is. <laughs> because it's got the, it's got the girl mathematics. <laughs> and I promised her that there would be only one question. Yes, that was a slight lie, but there will be only one. Now, it's traditional to start a, a lecture on mathematical modeling by looking at different scales. Yeah. And today I'm going to focus on these two scales, spanning about 21 orders of magnitude. And I'm going to ignore everything else in the middle. So let's see how that goes. I'm going to pose a problem to you. Okay, so the problem is that we have to design a, a bulk nanocrystalline steel, which is very strong, tough, and cheap. Now, all of these terms are very subjective, so I'm going to give you an idea of what that means. Well, bulk means <laughs> real big. That's the size of a human being. Yeah. Okay. I don't mean you know 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, but really big. Nanocrystalline means, you know, what the general public recognizes as nanocrystalline. Everyone knows about nanotubes. So we want to create a seal which has the scale of a nanotube. Okay. And strong, we want the strength to be better than that of a carbon nanotube. So at this point, many of you are not going to believe what I'm going to say, okay? But we want it to be stronger than a carbon nanotube. And when we say cheap, it must be cheaper weight for weight than bottled water. Okay. So let's see how we can go ahead and do this. Well, go back to 1956. We already had iron with a strength of 10 gigapascals, 10,000 megapascals. Incredibly strong. Okay. So if you, know, if you put one apple on one square meter, that's a stress of one pascal, because an apple weighs about a newton. So this is like putting 10 billion apples on one square meter. Incredibly strong. You see that. And if you calculate the theoretical strength of iron, that means when you have absolutely no defects in the material and you're simply slipping whole planes past each other, you can get to a strength of about 21 gigapascals. 
But notice that uh, the strength drops off sharply as the size <coughs> of your single crystal increases. And that's because the probability of finding defects increases as you make your sample bigger. And here we are relying on the absence of defects to get strength. You can commercially buy iron, which is 5.5 gigapascals strong. Okay, so this is stronger than carbon fiber. And you can see that it's a lot more ductile than carbon fiber. And this is made by taking, let's say, 50 grams of iron and stretching it out into two kilometers. So it's very, very severe deformation. The true strain of nine. And here, unlike the previous type, the strength is coming from the defects that we put into the material. Severe defects. And the scale is reduced to about five nanometers when you look at the structure inside this wire. Now, that makes it very insensitive to size compared with those single crystals that I showed you earlier. So that's a good thing, that when we introduce strength by deformation, uh, we can introduce things which are insensitive to size. The problem is that you have to put in this severe deformation, and that means that you're restricted in the shape of the product you can produce. Now, there are processes like equi-angle channel processing where you can maintain the shape, but nevertheless, those are very expensive processes, and really for niche applications. Here, for example, the size of the wire is comparable to the size of the thread that you get in stockings or in socks. Okay? Now, have a look at this really strange definition of a denier. You probably all come across it, but did you know that you know, one denier is the weight in grams of nine kilometers of fiber? Now, how on earth did we come up with that? <laughs> So the problem with severe deformation is that we restrict uh, the form of the product. We can't produce that huge truck by putting in that much deformation. Most of you will have heard about carbon nanotubes. Very, very simple. This is a, a sheet of graphene. You fold it up, join it up, and put some end caps, and you've got a carbon nanotube. And there are some extraordinary numbers that go with these carbon nanotubes. Uh, the strength, which is 130 gigapascal. This is strength beyond our dreams. And along the length, the modulus is 1.2 terapascals. Okay, so extremely scary. And these numbers are so astonishing that they have taken a sort of form of truth that almost everybody, including you know, if you read the Philosophical transactions of the Royal Society will state this trend and then compare it against steel as if steel is a homogeneous lump with unique properties which are constant. Okay. So I'm going to show you how we can beat carbon nanotubes in strength. 130 gigapascals. Well, the first thing is that we need to remind all these people who are making these claims that there can be an equilibrium density of defect. Because look, this is a, an equation uh, which we teach all undergraduates that if you form n vacancies in a material and you multiply by the <coughs> entropy of formation of that vacancy, that opposes the formation of the vacancy. But then, by introducing a vacancy, you increase the configurational entropy, which favors the formation of the vacancy. So if you differentiate that, you end up with an equilibrium number of defects. That means it doesn't matter what you do into your material, they will exist there on average. <coughs> so all materials will contain an equilibrium number of defects, and carbon nanotubes are no exceptions. Uh, I calculated the number of defects I should find in the rope that is being uh, considered for making a space elevator okay, out of carbon nanotubes. There will be at least 10 to the 20 very severe defects inside that nanotube under equilibrium conditions. So there is absolutely no nanotube which exceeds the strength of steel beyond the size of two millimeters. So when you read things like this in the newspapers, you know, that, you know, there are engineers who are, who are dri dribbling with saliva <laughs> because there's 130 gigapascals promise. Those engineers probably got their chartered engineer status not, you know, simply for being a scientist, not for being an engineer. <laughs> and that, whoops, sorry, I'll go back. Yeah. And that, you know, the carbon sheet is stronger than steel. This particular work, uh, 
um, what they did was they measured the strength by <coughs> suspending a drop of water on a tiny tube. So this is not, not something you can use for making a space elevator. <laughs> and of course what they've forgotten is that when you rely on strength from perfection, that will always fail when you scale the system up. So we cannot really do that. Strength in small particles uh, relies on perfection and is doomed as the size increases. Thermodynamics tells you that even in principle you can't scale it up. And the strength produced by deformation limits the shape. Now, around the 1960s, there was a huge change in the way in which we live because microalloy steels were invented. And they radically changed the properties of steels. So you could thermomechanically process the steels to produce very fine grain size. And there are now tens of billions of tons of these steels being used throughout the world. So that was a major revolution that started in Sheffield in Britain. And you won't find steels which are not microalloyed now. And the big improvements in properties happened because the crystal size was reduced by microalloy. So you could produce certain precipitates which stop the grains from growing. So I'd like to find out, you know, what is the smallest grain size that I could get by using thermomechanical processing, which is used to produce these steel. Well, uh, the grains are of this shape. I can work out how much surface we have per unit volume, okay. and multiply it by the surface energy, and that's the amount of free energy that's consumed in forming the grain boundaries. So if I use up all the free energy from phase transformation to create grain boundaries, that should give me the limiting grain size. So I can calculate what is the smallest grain size I will ever achieve. Skip that equation for your back. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is the curve that I get. And according to this, I ought to be able to get to really small grain sizes of the order of 0 0.01 micrometers by using realistic undercoolings below the equilibrium transformation temperature. But when you look at all the enormous efforts that are going on throughout the world to use thermomechanical processing, rolling, to produce fine grain sizes that haven't got beyond about one micrometer. <coughs> the reason for this is that when you do a phase change at a very high undercurrent, you get a lot of enthalpy released, and that heats up the material. So that's a phenomenon known as recalescence. So the enthalpy change actually heats up your material. And when you take account of that recalescence, you predict that you are not going to get much smaller than one micrometer using the most severe of thermomechanical process. So this is not going to help us. Thermomechanical processing is limited by recalescence. So how do we go about making uh, a bulk nanostructured material? Well, the first thing is that we need, if we do want to transform at a lower temperature, because we need that free energy to create smaller and smaller crystals. But we need to store, somehow store the heat of transformation within the material itself. We need to reduce the rate at which the crystals form so that the heat can be dissipated. And all that uh, amounts to transforming at a low temperature. Well, this is a, a displacive transformation. You take a crystal of austenite and you allow it to transform <coughs> to bainite by a deformation rather than diffusion. And you can see that there are some very severe changes in shape produced by the phase shape. Now imagine that these changes in shape happen with the crystal surrounded by thousands of other crystals. That's going to cause an enormous amount of strain energy. And you know, the equation for that strain energy was first derived by Jack Christian in 1956 in this department. Okay? So that amounts to something like 700 joules per mole of stored energy, huge stored. So why not exploit this as a mechanism of storing energy inside the material? The actual mechanism is very simple, that you create these completely supersaturated plates of bainite uh, without any diffusion. The carbon then partitions into the parent phase and then precipitates as cementite. And this stage can be completely eliminated by alloying, because we don't want brittle cementite particles in very strong materials. So if I add silicon to, to cementite, it raises the free energy of cementite by a very large amount. And another way of saying that 
is that cementite hates silicon. Okay, so you put silicon in your steel, and you will prevent or retard the precipitation of cementite. And some very elementary modeling shows you the effect of silicon here. So I've changed the silicon here from half a weight percent to one and a half weight percent, and you can see there's a dramatic change, not only in the kinetics, but in the equilibrium volume fraction. And by appropriate alloying, I can get rid of it altogether. So I can get rid of the brittle phase by designing the alloying elements. You know, the sort of work that Hume Rothery did many, many, many years ago. But I have problems because I want to do the phase transformation at a very low temperature. And I need thermodynamics to do the calculation. And of course, for the equilibrium region, there's no problem. I can get phase diagrams and thermodynamic data. But we want to transform at temperatures which have never been done before. And that means that we need to extrapolate these phase boundaries. <coughs> now, do I extrapolate them as straight lines because I want to do transformations at low temperatures, or should it be like that? Or what is the method that I use for extrapolating those phase boundaries? Well, depending on the method that I use, I can get an order of magnitude difference in the kinetics of the <coughs> But that's simply not good enough. And the reason why you have all these differences is that we use very elementary models in all these packages like thermocalc and anti-data and so forth, which are used for phase diagram calculations. They basically assume either an ideal solution or a regular solution where you, know, you have an entropy of mixing. But the entropy of mixing is treated very badly. You, know, you assume that there is a random distribution of atoms. And you can't have a random distribution of <coughs> atoms if there's a change in binding energy when you mix atoms up. Now, there is a theory to deal with uh, non-random solutions. It involves a huge amount of algebra, and that's why it's not popular. But the algebra is not difficult algebra. It's simply very long. Okay. So, we've been working for a long time to do these quasi-chemical models for carbon in iron, because carbon is one of those things which simply doesn't behave in a nice way. It doesn't obey simple models. And the problem with the quasi-chemical theory is that it's littered with mistakes, because there are so many, so the algebra is just enormous, you know, pages and pages of it to get to the right equation. So none of these papers are actually cited in the literature. Yeah. People will look at the paper and just throw it away, even though they use the computer programs. But, you know, I feel absolutely delighted that there is one citation yeah, which counts for a thousand of normal citations. And that in the theory of phase transformations in metals and alloys, the third edition uh, by Jack Christian, where look, he corrects the mistake that I found in the quasi chemical theory. Okay. Now that's worth many, many other citations. This is the final equation that you get after lots and lots of algebra, where you see this is the normal entropy of mixing, when you assume random mixing. This is a correction term, and this is a correction to the entropy of mixing. Now, there's nothing, uh, nothing uh, I want to point out in that equation, except for this term, which doesn't appear in ordinary theory, and that's related to the interaction between carbon atoms. So it's a carbon-carbon interaction energy. If I take a carbon atom, uh, two carbon atoms located an infinite distance apart and I bring them closer and closer together, then this is your carbon-carbon interaction energy. Now, for austenite, you can measure that using thermodynamics because the solubility of carbon is very high in austenite. But in ferrite, it's incredibly low. Yeah. Very, very low at low temperatures. So, we cannot actually determine it experimentally. We know that it should be strongly repulsive, okay? but we can't get a number. So, you can solve this using the sort of work you do in this department, first principles calculations. So, there is a unit cell of iron, 40 cubic cubic iron. These two carbon atoms are placed in the second nearest neighbor sites, where I expect the interaction to be slightly attractive, because if it wasn't attractive, we would never get the trigonal minus. However, if I put them in the nearest positions, then they should be a strongly repulsive 
force between those carbon atoms. Now, in, a, in first principles calculations, you can't really put the atoms an infinite distance apart. Yeah? Because we don't have, uh, the computer is capable of treating supercells that large. So, from this point of view, we are going to put them just three unit cells apart. That's infinite distance. And then we bring them together either in the nearest neighbor or second nearest neighbor positions. And sure enough, we get this huge repulsion between those two carbon atoms. So we can put that into the thermodynamic theory and essentially exclude all the near neighbor sites from occupation. And we also correctly predict a slight attraction when we put these two carbon atoms in second nearest neighbor sites. So there's first principles calculations making a contribution to steels, which is the most used material in the world. And of course, that same energy goes on to explain <coughs> the concentration dependence of the diffusion coefficient of carbon in arsenide, which cannot be explained using ordinary theory, Darwin's theory, for example, for the concentration dependence of diffusion. So all of these data are explained using that interaction energy. Now, I gave a lecture pre in a previous, uh, on a previous occasion in this conference where I also talked about the nucleation theory that we need to calculate transformation temperatures. And it's based on the dissociation of dislocations. But I just wanted to show you this slide to remind you that when we do nucleation calculations, it's not classical nucleation, but involving the dissociation of dislocations. So let's assume now that we have all the theory that we need to calculate transformation temperatures. I want to ask the question, what is the lowest temperature at which I can produce payment? Well, here are some calculations. And the fortunate thing here is that I can keep the martensite start temperature and the bainite start temperature separate from each other. Okay? Because if they converge, then basically I couldn't go lower in temperature to produce bainite. Now, according to this, I could even produce bainite at room temperature. If I, if I made an alloy with that concentration of carbon, I could produce bainite at room temperature. But we also need to look at kinetics of transformations. And here is a calculated time taken to produce bainite as a function of carbon concentration. And here it will take about a century to produce bainite. So what we've done is we've made an alloy which will take 100 years to transform. Okay? And we've archived it. There's one sample in Cambridge, one in the Science Museum. Okay? soon be on display. And by observing the surface, we'll be able to say whether the theory is correct or not. In a hundred years' time, I expect bainite to form it. <laughs> but in the meantime, in the meantime, we have produced bainite at the lowest ever temperature, which is about 125 degrees using this kind of an alloy. And I won't go into the details of all the different elements, but essentially, we've got about one weight of that carbon. <coughs> and we transform it at a temperature as low as 125 degrees centigrade. And just to give you an idea of what that means, the diffusion distance of an iron atom at 200 degrees centigrade in 10 days is 10 to the minus 17 meters. So it's inconceivable. It's inconceivable that these atoms be fused. And of course, that's not a problem because we are generating the crystal structure by a deformation, not by diffusion. And this is just to show you the calculated time for transformation versus the measured time. And this is a structure that we get, optical microstructure. Nothing remarkable about this. You must have seen many micrographs like this. Uh, there's nothing here to indicate that we've achieved the nanostructure scale, etc. But I want you to watch the next slide. I think, in my opinion, it's the best transmission micrograph ever taken. Okay. Um, that's a very controversial statement to make, but look, I'll show you the same structure. Look at the scale over here. Okay. So the thickness of these crystals of ferrite is the same as that of carbon nanotubes. We've achieved the same size scale, the controlling scale is 20 to 40 nanometers. We've achieved this in a bulk material by phase transformation. And furthermore, it's also a composite on the nanoscale because there are bits of the parent phase which are left untransformed. And that's very helpful because the parent phase has much better toughness 
than the product phase. The product phase provides the strengthening, but it has a ductile brittle transition temperature, whereas the parent phase doesn't. So we've got a wonderful, wonderful mixture of these slender crystals of ferrite. The controlling scale is the same as that of carbon nanotubes. And uh, it's transformed at about a quarter of the homologous temperature, about melting temperature. We have achieved the right scale. This is the hardest ever bainite to produce. And yet, you know, it can have enormous uniform ductility and toughness. Yeah, we haven't done anything here to control non-metallic inclusions, etc. It's uh, ordinarily produced steel. <coughs> so we've got very aspirin, a huge uniform ductility. We haven't put any deformation into this material. It's produced by phase transformation. There's no rapid cooling. Because it's a slow transformation, you can take the steel from 1,000 degrees centigrade, put it into a pizza oven, and leave it there, and it will transform. So there are no residual stresses from rapid cooling. It's very cheap, cheaper than the price of bottled water, and we can produce it in very large sections. Something like 200 millimeters thick will transform in three dimensions. Of course, we could have tried to transform a larger sample, but we don't have one. If you test the strength of this at very high strain rates, then it yields at about 10 gigapascals at very high strain rates. So that immediately suggests an application. Yeah. Um, and it turns out that this is extremely good at stopping what they call more serious battlefield threats. Yeah, I'm not told what those are. <laughs> and indeed, it outperforms titanium or the normal armor, and it outperforms alumina in the sense that it can take multiple hits. Now, there are three other major applications which are in progress, which have nothing to do with armor, but uh, civilian applications. But I can't talk about them right So, just to change, the subject, I promised that I would talk about three things. This represents what I call complex mechanical <coughs> properties. Okay. So there's fatigue, stuffness, uh, stress intensity, corrosion, and even the ordinary tensile test. I would challenge anybody in the world to give me a prediction of any of these properties if I give them the composition of the steel and the processing of the steel. The entire amount of work that we have done on mechanical properties, we cannot predict any of these properties. You can use measurements of these properties in design. You can give qualitative trends that look if I refine the grain size then I will get a better toughness, or if I make my specimen smooth I will get a better fatigue strength but nobody in the world can predict any of these properties. Now that's not very good when you want to design materials on a computer. But there are methods. Normally, we would use some kind of empirical equations, but there are better empirical methods to do this. Basically, uh, these methods are involve neural networks, and the neural network is very simple. Yeah. It's basically a very complicated mathematical function whose shape you can change very easily to fit a problem which is incredibly complicated. So a complicated problem cannot be dealt with simple mathematical functions. With a neural network, you can create <coughs> extremely complicated functions. Okay. There's nothing at all black box about this. The equation that you get is completely transparent. But when you have a non-linear model like that, you might actually overfit the data. So for example, is this curve the right curve for this data? It passes through every single point, but is it, still, is it the right curve to represent those data? Well, this problem is very easy to solve. You take your data and you divide it into half. You use one half for creating the model and the other half for testing the model. So you have a training data set and a test data set. Uh, and you know, the training data set is identified by the black points and the test data set by the white, uh, white points. This curve is too simple. <coughs> It doesn't capture either of the data sets. Okay. This curve is too complicated. It perfectly models the black points, but badly predicts the white points. This is the right level of complexity, where the noise in the training and the test data set prediction is 
identical. And therefore, we identify the complexity of our mathematical function to fix it by doing this analysis. So that's not a problem we need to worry about. Just to test whether you're still awake or not, can somebody tell me what the next two numbers are? <laughs> How about you? <laughs> 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 